uh, I, I want to begin with a question, and that is, when do you think little children first learn how to lie? Now, usually, the, response, the old answer is when they can talk, but it's actually much earlier than that. Number one in your message notes, we learn how to lie before we can speak, even. There was a research by the University of Sacred Heart in, in, uh, in Tokyo that found that babies, before they can even speak, they learn how to cry even when they're not in distress to fake their parents out to get their parents to give them what they want in that moment. And when you, the parent or the grandparent, go to them, when you, the parent or the grandparent, give them what they want, they need, or reassurance, or a hug, or whatever you do, they are laughing at you in their little old psychopathic souls of their minds. Because they know they got you. That's what all the research shows. Now, interestingly enough, that when kids learn how to talk, they expand their capacity to lie. But they're not very good at it at first. Check this out. No, who drew on mommy's mirror? I don't know. Was it you? No. Who was it? Did you eat hot chocolate? Can you tell me lies? What's on your face? What's on your face? Um, uh, sauce. What sort of sauce? Um, black sauce. John, what are you eating? You didn't eat anything. John? Can you explain to me why, why the sprinkles are empty? Did you eat those sprinkles? No. I did not eat those sprinkles. John, mm -hmm. you have sprinkles on your face. Did um, no. No. Now, now, the question is, where do these little people learn how to lie? From big people. Most famous research on this subject has found that the average adult lies, embellishes, stretches the truth, bends it, adds to it, spins to it at least three times, two to three times in a 10-minute conversation. Lying, stretching the truth, bending the truth, adding to the truth is in every place in our culture. We lie about our motives. We lie about why we're late to work. We lie about what we really said. We lie, we cheat on our taxes, on our expense accounts. We pad them on our resumes. We lie to our spouses. We lie to our children. We lie to our bosses. We lie in the games we play. In golf, they will ask you, well, hey, what do you make on that hole? Well, just put me down for a, for a five. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Just put me down for a five. I really got a six. But a six makes me feel bad about myself. Now, a four would make me feel great, but that would be a great big fat lie, and you wouldn't know it. But five is a Goldilocks kind of lie. Not too big, not too small. It is just right. So I'll tell you, put me down for a five. That is the condition of the human nature. We want to tell the truth, but we're prepared to lie. We're prepared to stretch it. We're prepared to bend it if we think it is necessary. Like the nine-year-old who said in Sunday school, a lie is an abomination to the Lord, our very present help in times of trouble. We lie to get stuff. We lie to sell stuff. We lie to um, impress people. We lie to get out of trouble. We even lie to ourselves. We lie about our age. We lie about our weight. We lie about our health. We lie about our alcohol issue. We lie about our anger issues. We lie about our porn issues. We lie about our addictions. We lie about how what, we're going to get home at 8 when we know we're going to get home at 10. It's just what we do. We lie in our families. We lie in our politics. We lie in so many places of our lives, in schools, in universities, in our politics. It is so bad. We, in our media, we now call it fake news. 
And we have fact checkers to now check the fact checkers because the spin is so out of control. And the number one finding in this research is how much you and I lie about our lying. This is the reality of the human condition. And our lies, I was thinking about this, to God are just as ridiculous because God knows is that little kid with the sprinkles on his face who says to his mom, not me, I didn't eat anything, not me. Hey, Adam, what's that on your face? What are you talking about? Adam, don't you have apple on your face? No, not me, it must be Eve. Eve, what about you? What about you? That, no, it wasn't me. It was the serpent. This is the nature of the human condition. And Jesus is not shocked by it. We're told very early in his ministry in John chapter 2 that Jesus knew that people's hearts. He did not trust them because he knew what was going on inside their hearts hearts. Now, Jesus is part of the time where he's going to talk to us about our truth telling. Because here's the deal. You can fool some of the people all the time. You can fool all the people some of the time. But you can fool Jesus none of the time. So he's going to talk to us about it. That's where we are in the Sermon on the Mount. That's kind of where we are. Now, we think if you're going to read this text, that Jesus is going to start the same way that he started. But he doesn't. When he started to talk to us about our anger, he goes back to the Ten Commandments. And he says, hey, listen, you've heard that it was says you shall not kill. But now I tell you, he doesn't do that on this text. When he started talking about our sexuality, he goes back to the Ten Commandments, the number seven. And he says, hey, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But now I tell you. And so now you're thinking, he's going to talk to us about our truth-telling. He's going to go back to the Ten Commandments, to number nine, which is, thou shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. But he doesn't do that. He is taking a different approach in this context. And it's interesting, I suggest, that this passage here is the least understood and the least read passage in the Sermon on the Mount. People even forget that it's there. So let's read it, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break an oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. And anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, some of you right now, maybe you're thinking, well, okay, I'm good to go. I don't do this. I don't swear by anything. I don't swear by Jerusalem. I don't swear by the hairs on my head. I don't swear by heaven or the earth. And why does Jesus even care? What's the big deal, right? I mean, maybe that's where some of you are. Uh, maybe some of you think, well, you, well, gosh, I really believe this. he's right spot on here. And you take it to the extreme. There are some folks who have taken this to the extreme. So much so, because Jesus said, don't take an oath. They will not go into the military because you have to take an oath. They won't get married. They'll live together, but they're not going to take an oath. They won't become a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout because it says you got to take an oath. They won't testify in court because you got to put your, your hand on a Bible when you go into court and make an oath. But this is not Jesus' concern as all. This is not some legalistic thing. Please remember in the Sermon on the Mount, what is Jesus doing? He is trying to describe to you and me what a person looks like, a good person looks like on the inside. Someone who is making progress toward perfection that is being more like Jesus in every part of their life. Someone who's surpassing the righteousness of the Pharisees. So in this text, he is contrasting, 
He's contrasting what the conventional wisdom of the day is about the interpretation of the law and what the heart of God is when it comes to the truth about the heart about, about, about the law. Now, to understand this particular text, we got to go back to kids. These lying little kids. And let's also acknowledge that all of us, in a way, are kids. We are just little kids in grown-up aging bodies. But at our heart, we are all just little children. And so, like little children, when we want someone to really believe us and we're afraid that they're not going to believe us, we, we add something. We go, I promise. I mean, I promise. I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. And then we kind of give our own way to communicate our sincerity, a child does. In fact, I cross my heart, I hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. I mean, if you don't believe me, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be a coffin, and there's going to be a needle in my eye, and it's going to be a, your fault, so you better believe me. That's the concept of an oath, and every culture has it. Because every culture has lying. That's why we have oaths and promises. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote a little, his own message about the Sermon on the Mount, this is what he said about oaths. This is number two in your message notes. Oaths give evidence to lying. That's why oaths came into existence. Because of the human nature, the state of human nature. Bend the truth, stress the truth, add to the truth. In the ancient world, these truths, these, these oaths, had a sacred quality to them. They would say something, may the gods deal with me ever so severely if I'm not telling the truth. Today, we say stuff like this. Uh, I swear on my mother's grave. I swear on all that is holy. I swear on a stack of Bibles. In the ancient world, they had oaths as well. And Israel was taught to make an oath in the name of the one true God. Here's an example, Deuteronomy. Listen to this right here. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. But sometimes just taking an oath in his name was not enough. My body, how I present myself, somehow be part of the oath. Genesis chapter 14. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And even today, if you testify in court, you take your left hand, put it up on the Bible, you raise your hand, your right hand, and you say, I do solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Now, in Jesus' day, if you were a good Jewish person, you would try not to make an oath at all, even using the name of God, because you do not want to desecrate the name of God itself. So you would substitute, I swear by heaven, I swear by earth, I swear by Jerusalem, or I swear by the hairs on my head. That's the background to the text, okay? That's how we got to where we are where Jesus says this right here. Now, what is our personal application here for us today? Number three, we use oaths to impress other people with our sincerity and get them to do what we want. Hey, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. We guilt them, we pressure them, we add to it, we spin it, we turn it upside down just to get them to believe what we believe so they will do what we want them to do. Uh, years ago, uh, we're going somewhere on a little trip, and we have three sons, and our two youngest are in the, the back seat. And, and the youngest of the two, uh, the, the baby of the family, all of a sudden, he just started crying because we heard a, a slap. I mean, slap. I mean, it's obvious he got, he got slapped. He's just crying. And before I can even turn around to look in the back seat, the other one says, Daddy, it wasn't me, I promise. And I'm thinking, okay. And I'm going, you little liar, you know, I mean. And, and he said, no, and, and he said, no, Daddy, 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 Daddy I, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. I promise. It really was, it wasn't me, Daddy. Daddy, you do believe me, don't you? And then I kind of started feeling guilty. 
because I didn't believe my kid. And then I thought, hold it. No, for the most part, I think you tell me the truth. But sometimes you can be a little liar. And Dallas looked at me kind of going, you just called our kid a liar. And I looked at her and said, you believe him? And she just turned around and looked at him and go, yes, mommy believes you. And I looked at her and went, you liar. <laughs> we had an interesting uh, conversation after that. Uh, uh, Jesus understands why we use oath. I swear. I promise. It's the gospel truth. We are desperate to get somebody to believe us. We want them to believe what we believe so they will do what we want them to do. So instead of simply saying, here's the facts, here's the information, you do with it what you want. I want to pressure you. I want to convince you. I want to override your will, your intelligence, your thinking, your judgment to get you to do what I want you to do. Swearing an oath in this passage in our day is like spin. It's like a song and dance. It's like stretching, bending, expanding to discipline upon somebody. Now, the ancient world, they added oaths as training wheels to help people who they knew were not telling the truth. The oaths were training wheels. Jesus is saying, now that the kingdom of God is here, now that I am here, it's time to take the training wheels off and learn what it really is to love people that you're talking to with your words. And here's what he's saying to us, number four. Love in the kingdom of God. I honor your will because that is the core of your personhood. I'm not going to try to pressure you. I'm not going to try to manipulate you. I'm not going to try to overwhelm you to convince and persuade you to deceive you in any way. Because I love you more than I want you to do what I want you to do. I honor you because I respect your will. I respect your judgment. I respect your thinking. And I surrender what I want. I surrender my way to the will of him who prayed himself, your will be done, your kingdom come, be done in me. Church, there is freedom in your life. There is forgiveness and power when you choose to live in the reality of the kingdom of God and you allow somebody else to do the same thing. You can tell somebody the truth without loving them, but you cannot love someone without telling them the truth. Dallas Willard put it this way. I love this little statement. Kingdom rightness respects the sole need of human beings to make their judgment and decision solely from what they have concluded is their best. Now, I'm not sure where I, I, I read this, but I remember reading it. That someone said the secret of truth-telling is to predetermine ahead of time that you are going to tell the truth, not stretch it, not add to it, just give the facts. I will tell you, I do not believe that is the secret to truth telling. We'll get to that here in just a moment. But for the rest of this message, here's what I want to do. I want to see how this concept played out in a character in the Bible. But before we go there, if there's anyone here right now that's feeling a little shame, that's feeling a little guilt, Feeling a little uncomfortable, I want to encourage you. The Bible is full of people who bent the truth, who stressed the truth, who spun the truth, who lied about the truth. Ab Adam and Eve, Cain, Abraham and Sarah, Moses, Aaron, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Rachel, David, Samson, Herod, Ananias and Sapphira. They're all over the Bible. 
But the greatest lie told in Scripture, the Mount Everest of lies, if you will, was told by a man who Jesus said, upon you I'm going to build my church. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is talking to his disciples and telling them, you are all going to disown me. You promised to follow me, but you're all going to disown me. And Peter kind of pushes back against Jesus. Verse 33, he says, even if I all fall away, Lord, on account of you, I will never, ever fall away. He makes a promise. And Jesus pushes back against Peter. Truly, I tell you, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you're going to disown me three times. And then Peter pushes back again. No, Lord, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think that Peter was sincere when he said that? Do you think Peter really believed he was telling the truth when he said that? I think he was. I think there's no question. Absolutely, he was sincere. I believe even to the point of probably having tears. He was so convicted that he could see himself laying down his life for Jesus. I'm going to suggest some of you here, you've been in worship, you've been joining us online, and something happens in the music or in the message, and you feel convicted that when you leave here, you're going to live your life differently, and you make a promise to God. Let me ask you, how does that play out? You were sincere in the action and in the word that you said to God. You might have even predetermined that I'm going to do this. Peter had predetermined, just like you did, in worship. But it doesn't play out that way. We see that a few hours later, Jesus is on trial. He actually uh, is in a court. And Peter goes to the courtyard. He follows him. And there he encounters a woman who kind of says, hey, I think you were with them. But verse 70 of that same chapter 26, Peter denied it before them all. He said, I don't know what you were talking about. Now notice he doesn't say, I never follow Jesus. Sometime when you and I find ourselves getting in the corner and we start kind of telling things, the lie is not that direct. We're not spinning it quite that direct. In fact, he might have been serious. He really, you know, maybe he was confused. You know, I really don't know what you're saying here. This is the problem when you start spinning stuff. You get good at it, and you start rationalizing it. Somebody can even come and ask you, are you sure that's the truth? And you kind of convince yourself, yeah, it is, and you go ahead and say it is, even when down deep, you know that it is not. And the question is, how did Peter go from, I'm ready to die for you, for I'm going to lie to you? How's that happen? What to any of us? What, what is the secret, the foundation for truth telling in our relationship with the Lord? In your notes, the foundation for truth telling, number five, I die to myself so I can live in the care and safety of God. I trust that God is watching out after me no matter what. I trust that God has me. I don't care what happens in my life. I don't care what they think, what they say. I just trust that God is looking after me. And if I don't believe that, if I don't believe that, I'm going to keep spin or lying or bending or stretching the truth in my back pocket that I can use as a tool to help protect me, to keep me safe, or to care for me. But when I choose to live in the reality of the kingdom of God, <coughs> I can die to myself, even in the small things of my life. And I want to invite you to do that this week. I want you to begin by getting to die to yourself in some small things. Now, I, I'll give you an example. I'm almost embarrassed to share this because it's such a trivial thing. I remember vividly when my dad and I were played our last game of golf together. I mean, we just both knew the way his health was going and his mind was going. I knew this we would probably never, ever play golf again. And so we're starting off playing together, 
and my, I'm not playing very well. And the scores that are going on my scorecard are not making me feel very good about myself. And I'm all in my head. If you're a golfer, you know about that place where you kind of start getting all the gifts and you start doing this and all this, trying to, and you do all these different things, but nothing works. You just start playing worse, and that was me. And I thought, what am I doing? I said, you know what I need to do? I just need to pray about this. You think, how goofy is that? But that's me. That's the world. That's the kingdom in which I, I live in. I need to pray about this. So I started praying before every shot. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Just very simple. Your kingdom come. So early in the round, I had this water hazard. And I'm about to hit over it. And I just pause and say, you know what? God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Hit the shot right in the water. I said, you know what? I'm going to pray again. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Hit the shot. Shot number two, right in the water. Shot number three, right in the water. I said, seriously, God? That's your will? <laughs> you know, really, God? That's your will? Now, I know right now you're thinking that's pretty trivial. That's, that's pretty minimal. But I will tell you, that's the way sin is. Sin starts out as trivial. It's about the trivial little desires for approval. It's the trivial little desires that we get our value and our worth attached to. Freedom is being able to play golf and make an eight on a par three and say, Jesus still loves me. Who cares? Freedom in the kingdom of God is for you to tell the truth no matter what it may be because you know you live in the care and the safety of God. No shame, no hiding, no deceit. I die to myself. I even die to my golf score. I die to the opinion of the people working out with me. And I'm living the reality of the truth of what God has to say about me. Oh God, oh God, your kingdom come, your will be done. You see, it's in the moments when I'm tempted to fudge, when I'm tempted to try to bend the truth, that I realize I've not died to myself. That's a cue. And I will tell you, that is the key. Dying to self, not determining I am going to tell the truth. It's dying to yourself. Peter's learning this. It's a process. He has another encounter. He moves out, to verse 71, it says, out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. I want you to notice now that, Jesus, that Peter is no longer in the courtyard Close to where Jesus is being executed, he has put himself physically further away from Jesus. See, that's what happens in a relationship when truth-telling goes away. You move away from the other person. You get as far away as you get from them. Peter knows if I stay close, I'm going to have to keep answering and dealing with the issue. He's hiding. He's protecting himself. All of the research shows when someone is stretching it, someone is bending it, our body betrays us. We tend to cover our mouths. We begin to cough. We cover up our core. We look in a different direction like the kid with the sauce on his face or the sprinkles on his face who couldn't look his mother or father in the eye. He turned his way. See, lying fractures the home. It disintegrates the soul. Verse 72, he denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man, exclamation point. Now, he couldn't get them to believe him the first time. I really got you to believe me, so he said an oath. Now, we don't know what oath that he said. Maybe he swore by heaven. Maybe he swore by earth. We do not know. All we know is he wanted to make it clear. I promise you, I crossed my heart. I, I hope to die. I'm telling you the truth. We, we, we don't know exactly what he said, but here's what we know. That when someone does not believe you, when you lie, you have to go a little bit further. He goes even further, and he says, I don't even know the man. Interesting. He wasn't even going to say the name of Jesus. Been with him for three years. See, this is what happens in relationships. If I know I'm sinning against you, 
I do not want to use your name because your name represents your identity, your little personhood, your will. That's why it's easier on Facebook or any other place to criticize and to punish and to do someone when you're not seeing them face to face. It's hard to do. But when I'm separated, oh, it's easy to throw those bombs. It's easy to do that because we naturally pull away from someone and don't speak their name when we know we're sinning and hurting against them. Back to the text, verse 73. After a little while, those standing there, they go up to Peter and they said, surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. That's interesting, that word accent. We live in a day where your status level can sometimes depend upon your accent. Peter, like Jesus, was from Galilee. They had a unique accent. If you're a hillbilly, unfortunately, in our culture, and you start talking, automatically people give you less credibility than if you're British. If you're British and you start talking with that English accent, people go, huh? People just automatically try to listen. So in this case right here, they knew that he had an accent like Jesus. They said, no, we know you are with him. You have that little hilly-billy accent just like them. And he denied it again. In verse 74, he calls down curses. He swore to them. I do not know this man. Now, who is he cursing? Maybe he's cursing himself. May God strike me dead if I'm not telling the truth. He knows he's not telling the truth. He knows it. So what about his faith in God? Maybe he's cursing God. God curse you. God damn you. God, what's the matter with you? God, why do you have me in this situation? Anybody been there? God, why are you doing this to me? I don't know him. I don't love him. I don't follow him. I'm not going to die for him. Maybe when you read the text in the Greek, it suggests he might be actually bringing down curses upon Jesus himself. God, curse him. God, strike Jesus. I don't know him. Peter now has a new God, his own skin. When you and I lie to God, we don't become an atheist. We just change the altar of saving our own hide, of saving our own face. Things fall apart. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. What have I done? Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. I've broken my promise to Jesus. I said I would die for him, but now I have lied about him. My soul, he is a mess. Don't raise your hand. Anybody been there? Where you know you have made promises to God and promises to your family and promises to people that you loved and you failed them again. Peter is a broken, shipwrecked mess of a person. But that's not the end of the story. What is about to happen is revolutionary. It is otherworldly. A classical literary scholar called Eric Arbach a German said this of the story. He said, Peter and his tears could not have been found in any other piece of ancient literature. Peter was not a king. He was not a soldier. He was not a subject. In the ancient world, nobody of well-bred would have sympathy for Peter. It could only be in the Bible. And he puts it this way. A scene like Peter's denial fits no antique genre. It's too serious for comedy. It's too contemporary and every day for tragedy. Politically, too insignificant for history. It portrays something which neither the poets nor the historians of antiquity ever set out to portray. The birth of a spiritual movement in the depths of the common people. What is the story of Peter? What is the truth of Peter's life? 
It is a strange new world where the kingdom of God breaks in through the tears of a broken, sinful, backwoods fisherman who takes the center stage of a story and pushes back two men like Pontius Pilate and Herod the Great in but supporting roles in the greatest story ever told in the story of history of the world. It is the Beatitudes coming to life. It is Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who know they are depraved, who know they have fallen short of the glory of God. And blessed are those who mourn that reality, who mourn their brokenness, their inability to reach the standard of the goodness of God. It's the Beatitudes come into life. It is Peter learning to live in grace. It's the script getting flipped. It's what God's doing in heaven, doing on earth. That is what it is. It is the miracle of God for the people of God. This is what it is doing. In Mark chapter 16, when the angel comes to the tomb of the resurrection, and the women see, and they cannot believe it, the angel says, listen, I want you to go tell the disciples and Peter. Why? Why did he say, and go tell Peter? Because Peter, you great big fat liar, you who have turned your back upon Jesus at his greatest time of need, there's enough grace in the cross for you, Peter. I'm not finished with you yet. In your notes, number six, the promise of Jesus is this. I receive new power and strength when I die to myself and I live in the power of the forgiveness of the cross. When you live in the power and the strength of the cross, when you die to yourself, you receive more strength and power than you could ever generate on your own. And that's a promise. I think it's so interesting that Peter is the one who wrote over in the second chapter of his little letter, rid yourself of all malice and deceit. So this week, this week, ask God to help you grow in love, to honor the peoples that you say you love, their little kingdom, to respect their yes and to respect their no. This week, no manipulation, no spin, no stretching it, no bending it. Just, yes, it's this way. No, it's not that way. Just the facts. This week, you live in the reality of the kingdom of God and feel the freedom and grace to get your approval from him and nobody else. This week, speak the truth in love this week in any area of your life where you're lying to yourself about your addiction about your health about the state of your marriage about your finances you just got your head buried in the sand you're lying just die to self Just die to it. The best way to live is to live in the kingdom of the one that when he was born, it was said he's full of grace and truth. The best way to live is in the kingdom one who said, I am the truth. And church, I will tell you, that's a promise. I cross my heart. Pinky swear. It's the truth. So I want to pray with you here before you walk out the door. If there's somebody here that just needs to, has an area in your life that you need to die to. Maybe it's your ego, your pride. Maybe it's an addiction. Everybody knows but you. You just keep lying about it. Covering it up. Maybe you're someone who's chronically late to work, to anything, to a family dinner. And you always got a little story to tell, you know, to kind of... Or 
or maybe you're lying about your relationship with the person you're sitting next to right now and you both know the truth but you just won't talk about it. God, we thank you for the assurance of the cross, for the grace that is there for each of us who are just willing to die to self and to live for you. If there's anyone here who can hear my voice right now that you just want to lay your life down and accept Jesus, his life in you right now, you can do that just where you're sitting right now. Watching online, wherever you are, you can just do it right there. If you would like to do that and you're doing that right now, just speak to a pastor and let us know and we'll walk alongside you and help you take your next steps in this journey because I'm telling you, it's the best way to live in the reality of the kingdom of Jesus, full of grace and full of truth. In his name we pray, amen.